Well, in a few minutes, you're going to hear something truly new. William Henry's first foray into the world of being a talk show host. I have hosted Dreamland every weekend since 2000, and now I am getting another host, not for every show, but William will be with us every so often, once a month maybe, maybe a little less often at times, maybe a little more often, because he's quite interested in hosting these programs, and with the depth of knowledge he brings to this, he, I think, is going to really be able to fill my shoes very well, because one of the problems that all of these radio programs have is hosts who are not really part of this very complex and very deeply, deeply difficult field to understand. William is as much a part of it as you and I are. So, William, I want to welcome you as host to this program. In a few minutes, William will be talking to Dick Hoagland, Richard Hoagland, for the first time appearing on Dreamland to inaugurate William Henry's hosting of the show. Welcome, William. Well, thank you very much, Whitley. I'm truly honored to... uh step in and fill in for you every now and then. I think it's going to be very exciting. Well, I do too, and uh, I think that uh, you're going to bring a, 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 a whole new perspective to things, but a very, a very uh, uh, shall we say, a very learned perspective as well, and I'm tremendously excited about hearing you talk to Dick. Uh, it's th- th- That is always awesome, and from the directions that the two of you come from, Coming together, it's just going to be, I'm, I'm just really pumped. That's all I can say. So let's get on with the show. William Henry, the next voice you will hear is William Henry introducing Richard Hoagland. So we'll be right back with William Henry hosting Dreamland. We're celebrating William Henry's first hosting of Dreamland today in a very special way. Any order you place that includes one or more William Henry books will also include an absolutely free William Henry DVD. This is the Stargate DVD, and it is an absolutely fascinating lecture. William at his very best, and it is good. It's absolutely free. Anything you buy in our William Henry section comes with the DVD. So... Go to the Unknown Country Store right now, click on that William Henry section, and celebrate William Henry as host of Dreamland with us. The DVD does not appear in the store. It will come in your order automatically. You do not need to include it. Subscribers, this will be the only mention of this in your version of Dreamland and the only ad in your version of Dreamland. So do take advantage. We do want you to know about this wonderful offer. Hi, this is William Henry. This is Dreamland. My guest today is Richard C. Hoagland, winner of the Angstrom Medal and a person who is a pioneer in both science and spirit and most certainly a big inspiration to a lot of us young guys in the field of hidden history. Richard, welcome to the program. Thank you, William. It's nice to be here. How are you? What's up at the Enterprise mission today? (laughs) What isn't? We have been waiting for word from Europe as to whether or not uh, the Mars Express mission has in fact detected ammonia and some other organics in the atmosphere of Mars, and there has been extraordinary confusion. There was an interview done uh, a few weeks ago by Linda Moulton Howe that appeared, I believe, on this show when Whitley was in the in the in the chair, and there were extraordinary hints from uh, this Italian scientist at that time that if he if he hadn't found them, he was so convinced that he was going to find them that he was even announcing which meetings he was going to announce. And then the meeting came and went uh, at the time that we're, you know, talking uh, last week, and he was, as far as we can ascertain, a no-show. He is apparently given to the BBC or to Nature uh, a terse set of comments that everybody jumped the gun, he didn't mean it, he hadn't detected anything like that, which is, if you read between the lines of the interview he did with Linda, uh, about a 180 degree turn. So it's our conclusion that he has been squashed, that he has been muffled, that he has, you know, followed the same sad fate of George Pimentel, who 35 years ago, literally this week as we we're talking, uh, made a similar announcement of ammonia on Mars from his experiment, which flew on the uh, first 
really in-depth reconnaissance of Mars, Mariner 6 and 7, sent by NASA in 69, and he was forced to recant a few weeks after he had come out before all of us gathered at JPL with this extraordinary announcement. Because you see, William, if there are these gases in the atmosphere of Mars, because they're so fragile and they're so evanescent and they're destroyed so easily by sunlight and oxygen and all that, it would mean pretty much that there has to be current life on Mars. And that's what he said to Linda, and the fact that he's backed off now in a rather dramatic and, and, and terse and acerbic way indicates that uh, maybe he's run into the reality of the suppression of the most important information the human race can potentially encounter. And now, conduct, connecting the dots on this, Richard, if, if we're going to suggest or we're going to present evidence that there's current life on Mars, doesn't this also then suggest the, the possibility of ancient life on Mars as well? And isn't that also behind the cover-up? Well, this opens the door to everything. Uh, once you admit as much as one microbe somewhere else, current, alive, happy, you know, going to the beach on the Sundays, watching television, whatever, um, you have opened the door to any extraordinary set of scenarios that you can imagine, including confirmation that that little life, that little guy, is surrounded by lots of other little guys, and it is only part of a long chain of guys up to and including intelligent guys. So yes, it's this seems to be part of the consistent political pattern, which is to make us unique, alone, solitary, all by ourselves, all that is, because if you keep it at that stage, you never have to confront the implications ranging from ruins to UFOs to who's knocking at the door right now. And so obviously we're at a critical crossroads in our destiny, and it's no wonder with a, an election coming up that they would want to keep the, the pot on the, or the lid on the kettle, so to speak, because it is about to boil over, it seems like. I wanted uh, to ask you about this, too. I know in Well, reference... before we leave that, let me, let me, let me uh, pick up on that point, because there is another potential scenario. If you go back and listen carefully to, to the uh, conversation that Linda had with Farmacino, which as I, as I said before, I think a Whitley aired on, on this show, you will hear him say several times that he wants to announce life on Mars in September. Ah. Now, you can't do that as a world-class scientist on a major mission, the first European mission, unless you got the proof. So the way I, I read, and, and if you go to Linda's website, you can actually read the words and, and cogitate on them carefully, but the way I read what Formacino said was basically that he had the data, but that he was politically waiting for the appropriate time to announce. Now, if it wasn't the Coast Bar meeting last week in Paris, and it is September, then that puts a whole new dimension on it, because September is just a whisker away from the November election, is it not? Well, of course, and now we're talking an October surprise here that maybe go along with the line of thinking that says we're, we're on, a, on a downward slippery slope here that begins with uh, 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 just a, it's a quick end to the Cold War with then a run-up to a war on rogue nations. It's all just a preamble to a war with the guys out there. Do you think this could be playing into a scenario such as that? Uh, no. No. No, I, look, we 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 don't have anything that could match what those guys out there have. It would be, you know, so that that old joke about you don't spit into the wind or or tug on Superman's cape. I mean, that would be insanity. And our people, while they're pretty well driven and obsessed, they're not insane. You know, no more than the rest of the human species. No, what this has to do is political framing for probably the reelection of George Walker Bush. And that, of course, would, would play in, in the following scenario. The president has put a lot of his metal on the line for his Moon Mars, you know, vision, which is kind of ironic given that the last vision we had of something to do in space that would benefit the human species went back to John Kennedy. Be that as it may, um, there's been a lot of criticism of this administration and the neocons, et cetera, because of, of Iraq, because of the warp war on terror because of you know patriot 95000 because of you know ashcroft because of the whole the whole kit and caboodle to change the conversation just before the election and bring up something so stunning as a central confirmation of life on mars which then would play directly into the president's vision and make him look like a visionary when of course you and i and 
those people listening to this program most know that this would all be carefully calculated politics and this announcement would you know his announcement back in, in in January was probably based on evidence that they already have that there's life on Mars so that you know it it's basically manipulation of of the, of the masses and changing the conversation the bottom line one one should be asking is why should this administration give a damn about what's on Mars why should they be putting any political capital into going there uh, ultimately with men and women et cetera et cetera and 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 to and to raise the ante in the last week we have seen Formastino muzzled if if we're reading the tea leaves correctly here but we've also seen this administration the president the white house uh officially willing to go to the mat to veto the nasa appropriations bill that did not give them all they wanted which was about a billion and change in the current nasa budget and because they're half a billion short the president through his spokespersons is willing to veto for the first time in my memory a NASA budget as one of the spending bills that goes into the entire federal budget. So, for some reason, this administration is saying at several levels space is important. And we've never had an administration since John Kennedy saying space is important. Now, you and I know space is incredibly important. The question that I put before the House is why does this administration think it's important? Why are they willing to put their political capital Carl Rove being the genius politician that he is on the line for something that most people perceive as so far down in the list of priorities it's not even on the paper that's the question we should be asking and the only logical reason i can think to for this all to be happening is because there's something so big waiting on mars that it cannot be suppressed much longer and someone is trying to spin it so they take advantage of the incredible positive fallout that that disclosure, that discovery, that leak, whatever it is that's, that's coming, will bequest to those who are on top of this curve. Let's talk about this in the context of the uh, the recent incursion in Iraq. And, of course, there was a race to Baghdad just a couple of years ago. And I want to ask you a question in this, in this context. In 1799, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, everyone knew without a doubt, that he was in search of the secrets of the temples of Egypt because Napoleon wanted to become a god. And while his overall mission failed, Napoleon was, was hailed as a hero because he released some of the secret knowledge that he retrieved from those temples, including incredible drawings that ultimately led to the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. Yeah, well, he took, like, what, a hundred, what they call, 500 savants? 500 savants, right, artists, and, musicians. And when he came back, painters. you know, the government formally published stunningly interesting i mean it was, it was literally like going with him as you as you rightly you know compare here to another planet and exactly. finding an ancient or you know alien civilization it was almost the equivalent of when nixon went to china china was in the position back in the uh, uh, 70s of that fabled land that no one could go to and when nixon went you know it was it was kind of like you know one potentate visiting the magic kingdom of another alien place. Uh, that Napoleonic comparison is very apt. So what you're saying is, are we on the threshold of something similar, only this time it's real aliens, real ancient stuff on another place, et cetera, et cetera, and I think that maybe you're onto something. Well, that's what I'm wondering, because we have a president who some think of as an emperor, who has launched an invasion of questionable intention, on an ancient land of mystery, and what were we there for? Is George W. Bush another Napoleon who has launched a failed mission, but now will will be able to backtrack and retrieve or or bring forward something that will seemingly make it okay, and potentially even if we look at it on the positive side, as the revelation of the secrets of secrets of Egypt did at the time of Napoleon, will launch us into a new era of of, of higher consciousness. Well, if it's going to do that, I think it will do it inadvertently and serendipitously, because I don't think that's the plan by that's now. That's not the plan, most certainly, no. But no. what but, can we anticipate possibly, and I know it's speculation, and you may or may not have data on this, what can we what can we look to and that may have been looted from that museum that's going to be, be trickling out here? I know Jim Mars has talked about the possibility that Saddam had uh, some of the monoatomic gold uh, secrets. I've talked that he may have been or was certainly seeking the Stargate secrets of the ancients. Can you talk for a moment about what conceivably is is was behind the race to Baghdad? 
Yeah, that's probably one of the areas where you and I differ because I don't think that anybody on this planet really has a handle on this technology and even if they were to find something stunningly alien and, and all, from off world they wouldn't know they wouldn't begin to know how to figure out how to make it work. Uh unless it was in perfect condition, all you had to do was press the on button. Okay, but, and what if it was in perfect condition? Well, but, that, the but, but that's, t- I mean, nothing else we've ever found is in perfect condition. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and Earth's environment is, is insidious in that it destroys everything because of oxidation, corrosion, you know, burying earthquakes. Uh, there is nothing that would last unless it was surrounded by some kind of a force field, you know, going back to Arthur Clarke's original Sentinel story, in which case we wouldn't have the wherewithal to crack it. It would sit there impervious to any attempt to get inside to figure out how it worked. Mm-hmm. So, no, but I, but what I do realistically think, and, and we've got to keep one foot in the real world, which is that we're the bumbling idiots on this planet trying to figure out stunning miracles and marvels and, and, and almost dazzling magic from another time and place. And what I've seen of these people is that they're the gangs that can't shoot straight. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so, so to say that Saddam, you know, would have access to something that would be a threat, that we would have to go and wrest from him, or just something that we wanted and we didn't want him to have. And we, but remember, we set Saddam up. This whole soap opera was set up in, in 1990, 91, with the first invasion, with, you know, uh, Gillespie, April Gillespie saying to him in that meeting, we don't really give a damn about, you know, Kuwait. You can just go and re-annex your 19th province, et cetera, et cetera. Then we turned around and we landed on, you know, with everything we had to make an example. Then we let him, you know, what was that was that great line from the Nixon administration from Haldeman or Ehrlichman, twist slowly in the wind for 10 years with resolution after resolution. And even the Clinton guys played along and did little things, but nothing major. And then we have George W., you know the the heir the uh, the uh, the heir prince of of his dad closing the loop finishing the job etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean the whole thing is is kind of like a Shakespearean tragedy but the bottom line the the underbelly of it I believe you know it has nothing to do with democracy has nothing to do with the torture chambers and the prisons and you know his his mythical weapons of mass destruction. It had to do with what was in that museum. And you and I, as far as I can ascertain, were the only two people anywhere on this planet before that invasion who said that's the reason we're going. Well, of and course. that's the key. Well, it isn't, it's never an of course with me. You know, <laughs> in science, you're always dealing with ambiguities. But in this case, remember, science is nothing if it's not prediction. We predicted in front of 20 million people on another radio program, I will say it, goes. Uh, that um, that was going to happen. And lo and behold, it did happen. And then it was kind of taken away. You know, the artifacts, the, the, the glittering artifacts, the gold and the masks and the, you know, the diadems and the, the kind of trinkets that people all go gaga over, a lot of them came back. But the real prize, which has not returned, was the looting of over 80,000 cuneiform tablets, cylinder seals, etc., in the basement archives that were gone in and, and, and deliberately yanked out of there by people who knew, A, where they were, and B, what they represent. And so, to me, the reason for this war seems to have been the knowledge base that Saddam had been quietly accumulating, pending the day when someone could figure it out. Now, a treasure which is knowledge, a treasure which is uh, an archive of a, of a window into ancient history as to who we really are. Remember, civilization began at Sumer. The United States of America, the West, is the heir apparent of everything that was written down and done in that land, which was, you know, formerly Sumer, now Iraq, 6,000 years ago, which is but an eye blink in the real history, I believe, of the human species, given what we're seeing on Mars. But the idea that that was done as a prelude to connecting the dots to what we're going to find on Mars itself, now that, to me, makes sense. But the bad part is that even if this scenario is accurate, we're not supposed to know any of it going on. No one is going to publicly connect the dots. 
It's all being done in secret. It's all being done by usurpers, and it's all being done by an elite that basically are feathering their own nest, and the rest of us be damned. Well, that's for sure, and this is the reason why it's so important that we have discussions like this, because what we're, we are able to predict that this is what they were going after, and now what's happening to those artifacts is, is anybody... Well, look at have... how Carl Rove, who is the... Remember, there's, there, there's, there's a book running around Washington called uh, uh, Bush's Brain, <laughs> which is, which <laughs> is scary really... I, I forget who authored it, but it was by one of the, one of the uh, advisors to the uh, Bush administration a couple of years ago. And it basically paints the picture that Karl Rove is the real brains behind, political brains, behind anything that Bush does. For him to risk political capital when this administration is under incredible and serious threatening assault by the Kerry Edwards ticket, the very week of the Democratic Convention in Boston, to be willing to go to the mat against Congress, a Republican Congress who basically says, no, George, you can't have that half billion dollars, we can't afford it because we want to all get reelected, to go to the mat for something so silly to most people as the NASA budget, and for something as visionary and far out and looney tunes from a lot of people as the moon and Mars, I mean, how is that relevant to people's ordinary everyday lives? That, to me, is the most telling thing in this weird week. And you put these dots together which is the continuing problem with Iraq, the continuing suppression of information about life on Mars, a la Farmacino at uh, the Coast Park Conference, and then the budget battle over NASA and over whether we're going to have this vision. And the bottom line is we're on the threshold. They need that NASA plan as perhaps a fig leaf or a diversion or an excuse to spend a lot of black money in projects that we'll never get to see so that they, not us, but they, get to Mars and put these clues together for themselves. Let's talk about uh, some of those clues and the ways that uh, the listeners and the audience will be able to put them together for themselves. Uh, you've, you've talked in the past about this idea that NASA talks in slant. Could you uh, talk <laughs> oh, about yes. that for a moment, please? My, my, my famous Emily Dickinson comparison. Well, yeah. Emily Dickinson, who's one of my favorite poets... And I guess it's because even before I got into all this, uh, I kind of had an intuition that that's where this would lead someday. She had, um, and she was asked one one time back in the 1800s, which was you know writing in fine fettle, uh, as 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 a woman poet. Remember, a woman poet in those days was was a was an alien, was an anomaly, it was definitely almost like an ET in amongst us as 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 we live here. And someone asked her, well, what did her poetry mean? And she said, you know, kind of slyly, she says, well, I try to tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And what I found over the years is that if you if you read between the lines in the NASA database, in the public pronouncements, in the conferences, in the papers that are, you know, written and published, it, in, the, in the discussions, you know, on various uh, forums, and, you know, the, 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 the public disclosures that come from time to time, if you put all that together, you get the truth, but you get it slant. And you've got to do a lot of decoding, you know, with other data, with independent, you know, confirmation and correlations before you can actually uh, put together something approaching a real picture. Right. And I wanted to ask you about a person that I feel was using slant and wonder if you agree, and that's Carl Sagan. And maybe you can address a question that I've had about uh, his book and the movie Contact for a long time. In that movie, if you recall, there was a blueprint for a device that was beamed to Earth in a consortium led by a character named S.R. Haddon construct what turns out to be some form of a particle accelerator for opening a wormhole. And, of course, in the movie, uh, Jodie Foster's character goes through the wormhole to the center of our galaxy and then returns. Yeah, it was a hyperdimensional transit device. Exactly. This is, to me, highly rep- reminiscent of what we see uh, in terms of the gateway experiences of ancient kings in Samaria, ancient Babylon, including the Assyrian king who rebuilt Babylon, whose name happened to be S.R. Haddon. And I'm wondering, did Carl Sagan have a belief in ancient civilizations and their use of technology? I'm wondering if you could talk about that for a moment. Well, I, I can give you what's on the record. The, the, when I first noticed uh, Carl's interest in ancient civilizations was with, with a book that he and Shlopsky, the famous Russian astrophysicist, published in 1966. It was called Intelligent Life in the Universe, and it, it was a it was a 
blinding overview of the potentials, uh, both in terms of current science and in terms of speculation. And one of the things that uh, Carl did, and it turned out that he's the guy who, who did it, Shlosky's book kind of got hijacked by, by, by Sagan, which, you know, in hindsight is not a surprise. But just to read any of the Sagan biographies for you Sagan, you know, people out there, and you'll find a very different person than you think you know from television. Uh, and that's spoken as someone who was, who was a friend of Carl, and, and I have many things that I respect Carl for, and I also have many differences, certainly political differences, with how he he navigated his way through the uh, uh, Scylla and Charybdis of Washington and, you know, huge federal science and the NASA, you know, situation, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think Carl could have been a lot more forthright with a lot of this on a lot of things if he had chosen, but he had made his deal with the, you know, devil, his Faustian bargain, and he had to live with it up until the day that that, that he died. In in this book, in, in Intelligent Life in the Universe, co-authored in the 60s, 66, with Shlovsky, there's a whole section dealing with Sumer, with the Sumerian civilization. It was my first encounter with uh, the Barossus legend, with the Oonus material, with with the so-called contact scenario that the ancient Sumerians literally ad- admitted that they owed their civilization to when kingship was lowered from heaven, when knowledge came down from the sky. And although Carl was very careful to tiptoe around saying this was real, what he did say, which again was back to Emily Dickinson, was that it was so close to the thing that you would look for in terrestrial mythology vis-a-vis a, a, a real contact story, a real contact record, that it should be researched much more thoroughly. Then, of course, when Sitchin came out uh, a few years later with his analysis, you know, Sagan jumped all over him and said, you idiot, you bum, dumble, you know, bumblehead, you dumb, you know, slow, you... The party you, line. You, you are not doing this at all by scientific methods, but of course Stitchin took it ten steps further and Carl took ten steps back. But that putting it out there on the record and, and limbing it out that there's what you should look for was classic Sagan. And he did that with Sidonia many times. You know, he would he would say one thing in public, you know, he would castigate what we're doing in public and then he would privately do things that were astonishing. But you could never prove. I mean, there was no written record. I, I could not stand up in court and have anyone believe that Carl Sagan behind the scenes was helping our Sidonian investigation. But I know, you know, me, myself, and I, uh, and a couple other witnesses, that this, in fact, was, was the case, again, up until the day he died. So, yes, Carl is my quintessential Emily Dickinson example of the tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Right, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking about uh, George W. Bush and his inauguration. In a, <laughs> a 14 minute speech, twice he asked the question Does the angel in the whirlwind still direct this storm? Mm. Does the angel in the whirlwind still direct this storm? Now, did that come from Washington's vision at um, uh, Valley Forge? No, it was actually in a letter that was written to Thomas Jefferson. Okay. But in fact, the source of that was a poet by the name of Joseph Addison. And the full four-line quatrain says something, and I'm paraphrasing it. He said he asked the question, does the angel in the whirlwind still direct the storm? And it hurls death and terror over the guilty land. And that, to me, is a is just a phenomenal example of the slant that you're talking about, because here's a president saying, asking one question, but if you follow the line of thinking with it and connect the dots on where the, the source of the, the poem actually came from, you find that he's asking the question of the angel in the whirlwind, which Sitchin, of course, would uphold as some form of a E.T., is hurling death and terror over the guilty land. And this is made all the more scary when we realize what happens nine months later on September 11th when death and terror was hurled over the land. You want to hear an eerie, eerie, eerie coincidence? Absolutely, please, yeah. George Pimentel, 35 years ago, this Berkeley physicist who built this infrared spectrometer that flew to Mars, past Mars, in 69, just a few days after you know, Neil and, Bun, uh, and Buzz had come back from the moon. We believe, I believe, in looking at the data, and I published it in Enterprise. Just go to enterprisemission.com and you'll read a, uh, a, uh, uh, an article that we wrote called uh, Methane on Mars, Back to the Future? Question mark, Because what's going on now is an eerie reprise of what went on 35 years ago. 
Pimentel made this big announcement, and then weeks later, he held a press conference in Washington at NASA headquarters, you know, 3,000 miles east of JPL, where the original announcement that I was witness to had taken place, and he basically recanted. It was kind of like Galileo, you know, where the church basically forced him to deny that the earth moved. Right. You want to know the date of that recantation of life on Mars announced in 69? Hit me. September 11th. September 11th. So is that a slant date that we're looking at? I mean, is that... Go and read our take on 9-11 on Enterprise. Okay. Which is uh, called Who's the Enemy Really? Okay. And you will see, to the best of our ability at that time, a turgid tale of secret societies, the Templars, you know, the, the Arabs against the Templar invasion of the Middle East, the Holy Land, knowledge swamped back and forth, an enmity which continues down to this day, I believe. And at the heart of it is the memorialization of this date, 911 years ago, on September 11th, 19, uh, 2001, which is when this feud between these two great secret entities that are vying for control of this planet began. It's all there in that in that piece. So look for who's the enemy really in, uh, in on Enterprise. Uh, in uh, we published it in the beginning of 2002. It took me from September to I think January, February to put the pieces together in a form that I could document and stand behind. So look in our archives for 2002. Who's the enemy really? Which is our take on 9/11. I'll do that. There's another number that uh, is on a lot of people's minds these days, and that's the number 2012. Oh. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> I, I know that um, back in '99 that you were involved with or, or on the it, let's just call it in the mix when there was the attempt to place the golden capstone with the hair etched on it on the Great Pyramid. That of course didn't happen. Now we're getting geared towards 2012. Do, do you see a connection between the events, the the failed events of 1999 to put the capstone on the pyramid, and what's coming up for 2012? Well, this goes back to who's really running things and who's in and who's out. You know, who is, is you know, and, and I'll, I'll bring Sagan back into this. Uh, when we started this whole investigation into Sidonia and Mars and ruins and all that, we were joined by a number of very well-credentialed and bright people. One of them is John Brandenburg, who was a plasma physicist, nuclear physicist. He worked at Los Alamos for a while. He's now somewhere in Washington working for an independent think tank, I believe. He's maintain a very avid interest in Mars. He's written a couple of books on the subject. He's worked with DiPietro Molinar. And he worked with us in the beginning. Uh, he came to us by way, I think, of a, a public show or something, and he tracked us down and wanted to kind of join our, our, our team, our fledgling team at that point. This is 1983. And we were writing a paper, you know, based on our initial results to be presented at the uh, first Mars conference held in 1984 in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, right, yeah. I wanted to ask you about your days back in Berkeley around 83 with Arthur Young and all those guys, too. So we can Yes. Get anyway, so uh, John, you know, being a nuclear physicist, had no compunctions against, you know, sending an email to Carl and saying, you know, we're, we're working on this. You know, what do you think? Since Carl was the public persona when it came to life out there. And Carl wrote him back a most stunning and arrogant reply. Again, you know, quintessential. Emily Dickinson. He said, and I can quote this verbatim now because it's one of those things that's kind of burned in flaming letters on my mind. <laughs> he said, it's not whether you're right or wrong, sir. You're not even in the conversation. <laughs> oh, man. I that's... mean, wow. Yeah. Zing. Cold. Cold, but very accurate. The way this works, the way this game works, is that there's an in-crowd and an out-crowd. If you're in the in crowd, yes, you get to play the game. If you're in the out crowd, they don't even acknowledge you exist. They don't care if you exist. You can die and go away, and they won't care. That was what Sagan said to John Brandenburg. Now, if you extrapolate from, from that to what's going on now, the bottom line is that all that's occurring vis-a-vis -vis Mars, space, the Moon Mars Initiative by these people is basically for their benefit. The rest of us don't count. We're at, at worst noise to be kept at bay, to be suppressed, to be, you know, kept in a box, to 
be kept uncredible with the New York Times and CBS, et cetera, et cetera, for as long as it takes for them to consummate whatever plans they have. And part of those plans, I now firmly believe, include getting ready for what they believe is going to transpire in 2012. And this whole millennium celebration was, I mean, the, the damn thing even was conceived on the wrong date. Right. Anybody who knows calendars knows, you know, as Arthur Clark and Stanley Kubrick gently tried to tell us, that the real millennium began 2001. You know, 1900, 1901, that was the beginning of the next millennium. 2000, 2001, that's the beginning of the, of the next century, and, and the, in this case, the next millennium. Uh, but why was there all this fuss and fury at the network level, at the political level, um, when, when uh, uh, Zahi Hawass, who was the kind of keeper of the flame at Giza, was planning to throw his party and put the golden capstone on with a helicopter, you know, a nice light, it wasn't solid gold. I mean, they could never have lifted a solid gold right. capstone. It was basically a frame, an aluminum frame with a gold sheeting over, over aluminum, you know, with appropriate symbols. But it was all symbolic. It was all to basically close that loop about when the capstone is put on the pyramid according to Masonic tradition, you know, the new world order has taken over and a new day dawns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I got intrigued with why they all missed the date. How could so many bright people get it wrong? Now, this is not a matter of, you know, discussion or opinion. It was wrong. Flat, blankety-blank, wrong. <laughs> well, when I when I began to look at the relationship between the pyramid itself and the Baval model for alignments of its, uh, you know, long internal uh, uh, tunnels right. with certain stars, in mm -hmm. particular the star Sirius, yes. suddenly all made sense because 2000 was exactly 12 years right before 2012 the earth goes around the sun one degree per day and there's a line out of i think it's uh uh the new testament where jesus tells you know people that you know to to my father you know a thousand years is but a day or a day is a thousand years in other words there there's there's an equivalent metaphor for time where one can be substituted for the other. So it turns out that the alignment in the sky between the pyramid and Sirius and the pyramid and Orion, if you do all the calculation, and I put this up in our End of Days series, which again is on Enterprise, just do a search on End of Days, Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, etc., etc. You'll see all this laid out with graphics, diagrams. It turns out that if you actually look at the sky, that night of December 31, 1999, the transition to 2012, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, a star which we now can prove is connected in mythology to Mars and Sidonia. And there's a stunning piece of work uh, done by David Flynn, which really has now proven all this, and it'll be part of the video series we're putting out on the University of Wisconsin conference held last fall, called God, Man, and E.T., which we're close to uh, finish. On the, on the edit. Oh, excellent. Good. And you'll be able to see how this all works in, in David's work. The bottom line is there's a connection between Mars and Sirius. It turns out that that alignment of Sirius crossing the meridian, the Giza meridian, the Great Pyramid meridian at midnight, for the only time in galactic history, nothing like this before, nothing like this after, but that one night on our calendar was December 31, 1999, the date that they were all going to do their big party with putting the gold capstone on the Great Pyramid. And because of this metaphor or the substitution of 12 years or 12 degrees and the 12 degrees marking the alignment in the sky between Sirius and the uh, December 21st Mayan calendar uh, 2012 alignment which is 12 degrees it turns out that that alignment, that, 20, that 2000 alignment, was in, in essence a countdown clock to 2012, marking 12 years to the minute when the next key alignment, which is the 2012 alignment, whatever's going to happen then, will happen. Wow. And the in crowd knows this, and we're celebrating this, we're planning to celebrate it. I mean, they actually held their celebration minus putting the capstone on, you know. Oh, a right. whole bunch of world leaders, George Bush Sr. included, you know, the Queen of England and Prince uh, Charles and, 
you know, anybody who was anybody was invited. I mean, you could almost do a roster of who the in crowd is by simply looking at the guest list for Zahi's party at the foot of the pyramids that night in 1999. And, so and it's now... because they were celebrating. Oh, and the same time that was going on, there was this stunning, you know, crystalline sphere lowered as the ball atop the uh, uh, number one uh, Times Square in the time, annual Times Square, you know, New Year ceremony. Right. And the ball was, was studded with spinning tetrahedron. I remember that. That was incredible. That's also an enterprise as part of our end of, of day series. So, yeah, we are in the countdown to the end of something and the beginning of something else. And the in-crowd knows it. The out-crowd doesn't. The in-crowd wants to keep it that way. And for people in this audience, they damn well better get very curious about what it means because it could have fundamental, overarching, archetypal meaning for everyone on this planet. Yeah, and that's what's so incredible about it. Uh, the researcher John Major Jenkins has pointed out that the Mayans said that in December 2012 that a serpent rope is going to emerge from the galactic center. And from out of that serpent rope is going to emerge a god of enlightenment. And what I've tried to do is match up this Mayan serpent rope, one with John's proclamation. Or Wait suggestion. till you see David Flynn. I see. I'm 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 very respectful of other people's work, and I don't want to steal his thunder. Okay. I, I want to put David's work out there. It's actually in a book that he has published uh, called Sidonia. Uh, the Mystery of Mars, I believe that's the subtitle. We'll have to have him on Dreamland to talk about it. You will it. definitely have to have David on. Uh, he is an extraordinary researcher, genius caliber. He's done all this by himself with very little help. He apparently, you know, uh, gives a, a nod to me for kind of nudging him in the right direction, but he has really done an extraordinary job of putting these dots together. He, he deserves full acknowledgement, and the story that comes out is so independently confirming of the story that we have figured out and that others have figured out and wait till you see what the serpent rope in Flynn's uh, mythos actually means. It's a stunning tour de force of research that connects dots in a way that is, I believe, the real dots. And, and I will leave it there because you've got to have him on. Okay, and it sounds like it's going to blow the lid off everything we know about the Great Pyramids, about the Mayans, about Mars, even about our own reality as souls as about well. About Iraq, about the war, about what this administration is up to, about what's going to happen. The only thing it doesn't answer, and none of us are in a position to, today to answer that question, is what is really going to happen in 2012? There are two scenarios, and I think the last time you and I talked, we, we discussed this bifurcated you know, scenario. One is, it's something horrific. It's planetary, it's catastrophe. The world basically ends. And, you know, I'm not married to that idea. I'm, I can kind of live with it, at least till 2012. But I don't, in my heart of heart, believe that's what's going to happen. I believe, and there's a couple of clues here that I want to wait till we get Flynn on the record before I go into them. I believe that it may be more inclined toward the Jenkins scenario despite what these guys are planning, and that has to do with how people, ordinary people, just us folks listening to this, respond. Because remember all the Casey you know, predictions that did not come true? About the opening of the Hall of Records? or No, the, the about world, the California changes. falling into the ocean, right. all yeah. that stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, people look back, and he was pretty accurate on lots of things. Well, why was he so wrong on that? It's because... Of Art Bell, it's because of Coast, it's because of, of the Internet, it's because of a, of a rise of a whole new consciousness, which basically, in the, in the hyperdimensional model, consciousness can make a difference. Right. And if we enlighten enough people, and enough people desire an alternative future of hope, of sincerity, of integrity, of, of enlightenment, of aspiring to the best of the human condition, well, that can change worlds. It can change this world, and that's implicit in these two opposite polarity scenarios. Well, one, like doom and gloom, and the other, extraordinary potential. That, that's it, what I'd like it, to point it, out. Sorry. It, it is within our power, William, I think, to choose. It's all about choice. So right. let's choose the right one. In talking about slant, I mean, I just love it when President Bush comes on the air and says, we're winning the war on Tara. 
<laughs> win war on Tara. Well, is he saying terror or Tara, which it means compassion and enlightenment? Because that is the choice right there. We're either going to choose Tara, compassion and enlightenment, or terror is going to get the best of us. And I just cannot, I just think it's a just profound example of that slant that you're talking about, that all of a sudden, at this time, that we're moving towards a new alignment here in 2012 and a higher consciousness, that that word t- terror... Who is, been, who is the gal who wrote Gone with the Wind, the uh, novel? Oh, uh, Margaret... Uh, Margaret, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm <laughs> just saying, well, whoever she was, and some of us... Margaret Mitchell, but, sorry. Margaret Mitchell, yes, yes. Um... She knew something because what did she call that symbol of the forgotten, you know, glory of of the South at the end of the Civil War? Of course, she called it Tara. Called it Tara, right? And that haunting theme. So yes, novelists, politicians, religious people, scientists. There's a whole bunch of people that seem to know this story. It almost reminds me of that great scene on on Johnny Carson one night where George Gobel was there and 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 uh he kind of showed up late you know was wandered in as they would have some guests just kind of drop by and frank sinatra was sitting on the couch and uh jerry lewis and dean martin and sammy davis jr and global uh george global comes out and he's sitting there and after one commercial break he's kind of looking down this couch you remember johnny's couch right oh sure and he's he looks at the camera and he says and then cox and i toward johnny he says you ever get the impression that life's a tuxedo and you're a pair of brown shoes? <laughs> I mean, the idea that there's an in crowd and an out crowd and all the rest of us are brown shoes is the way these people think. But it isn't the last thing they will think because it is in our power, since there's more of us than them, to change the way the thinking goes. Right, and so the key then is the pole can shift within us, and that shifts the pole out. Here. That's what the hyperdimensional model is now clearly saying. Clearly. And I will be documenting that in the next few months with some amazing things that we've learned at Carl Castle and that we're learning even now as we're making some recordings with new instrumentation. And, and all that has to be carefully you know, published and documented and buttressed. But when, when it is... Uh, I defy anyone in the mainstream to dismiss it as nonsense because it is reproducible. We have a handle now for the first time on how this physics works, and consciousness is a key part of how it works. If that's true, then we can determine which scenario will happen in 2012. Right. Hey, by the way, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Bay Area UFO Expo. That's Canada, right. August. We're going we're gonna to get to go to the Golden State again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the people that I want to see there is a guy named, that, that George had on a, a, a little while ago, named, um, uh, oh, I can't, my mind is going, folks. I'm I'm losing my mind here. Um, Give me a clue. Maybe I can help you. Oh, he's, he's the Billy Meyer guy. Oh, I, I can't, I know who you're talking about. But, uh, <laughs> Michael Horn? Michael Horn, yes, yes, yes. Because Billy Meyer, get this, somehow was able to publish in the 1970s data we are now reconfirming and that Flynn is reconfirming through totally separate venues in the early parts of the 21st century which tells me that we need to be asking very seriously who did Billy talk to what were his sources even if they weren't some Yassi and company you know the, the failed Pleiadians if he's only doing it from documents it's important because somebody knew something that we now are rediscovering and more dots are coming together. Right, and I'll never forget the first time I saw the Billy Meyer video driving home and for the very first time really looking out at those points of light in the the dark sky and realizing there's whole space beyond that. Those aren't two-dimensional dots, there's three-dimensional space beyond that and we're certainly connected with it. Well, what's intriguing is that Sirius and the the connection to Mars and Sidonia comes up in the the, uh, Billy Meyer documents uh, and this was done before we even got to Mars. They were oh. published, those conversations took place in 1975. Viking didn't arrive there until 1976. Incredible. On that r- note, Richard, I've got to go, and I want to thank you very much for talking with us on Dreamland today. It's been my pleasure. Hey, William, we got to do this again. I look forward to it. Thank you. 
One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's the Emmy Award-winning TV producer, documentary and filmmaker, and writer, who is also the reporter and editor for EarthFiles.com, the Internet's most respected edge science website. Today, she has a remarkable report for us indeed on an anomalous animal shot in Texas. Here she is from Philadelphia, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. Today I've got anomalies from the crops to that strange animal that some media are calling a chupacabra down in your neck of the woods southeast of San Antonio. First, let's start with the plants of the world. The number of crop formations reported now is about a hundred plus including one yesterday at West Overton in Wiltshire, England. A pilot swears that he flew over the field in mid-afternoon and the field was normal. And then, only one hour later, he flew back and there was a large serpentine formation. When he landed, he immediately contacted Stuart Dyke at the Crop Circle Connector, and Stuart went there and was amazed at the formation and fortunately took ground photos. Sadly, when the farmer found out about this pattern in his crop, he immediately got on his harvester and went into the field and obliterated an incredible formation that would seem to prove this time, in this case, that humans were not the creator. You can see ground shots of this wheat formation at my website, www.earthfiles.com at the top of the headlines page and in a special report that I'm doing on British crop formations in July. It has been intense in southern England. Also at www.cropcircleconnector.com it is a constant upstream of news and images about what is happening in England. Now also I talked this week with Paul Anderson Director of Canadian Crop Circle Research Network in Vancouver about the crop circle season there so far. He has received four reports of crop patterns, the first beginning with a simple ring in pasture grass on June 24th in New Brunswick. Over the past decade, New Brunswick has had only a few formations, in contrast to Saskatchewan and Alberta, which have had the most. From Paul's research of Canadian history of the phenomenon, he has found 233 reports between 1925 and 2004. Saskatchewan is the center of activity, quote, sort of like Wiltshire is in England, unquote, he says. Of the four crop formations between June 24th and July 12th, two stand out as unique. One pattern across Lake Erie from Cleveland, Ohio, near Leamington in Essex County, Ontario, was created in soybeans by something that scorched the plants, which then disintegrated to bare soil. Two weeks later, in Tabor, Alberta, another pattern in tall barley was created by something that seemed to evaporate the plants without leaving any traces in the soil, not even where roots should have been. You can see images of both the Lemington, Ontario, and Tabor, Alberta dirt patterns at my website, www.earthfiles.com. At the headlines page, look for 2004 Canadian crop formations, scorched soybeans, and dirt pattern in barley, and click on the hot link to this report. So now we can add a new phrase to the crop formation investigations, dirt patterns within living crops. Here now is Paul Anderson beginning with a scorched soybean case, which implies that some kind of intense heating energy interacted with the plants. But what was unusual about this case, <coughs> the soybean plants themselves were about three to four inches tall at the time, uh, so not very big yet. Um, but when the farmer first found this one, uh, all the leaves on the plants of the soybean plants uh, were missing. They seem to have just been like, as the as the witness put it, burned off, so to speak. Um, and the remaining stalks, the stalks themselves, stems were still standing. They hadn't been flattened down. 
they were still standing within the circle. Uh, it's just that all of the leaves were missing, uh, just like they had been stripped off, and then no one knows what happened to them. They weren't just laying on the ground either. Um, and the stalks, the standing stalks, had turned dark brown. They looked like they had been charred. So it's almost like something came and burned off all the leaves, leaving the stalk standing. But then according to the farmer, over about the next week, uh, the, the remaining stalks, in turn, then disintegrated, as he put it, and just, like, turned into dust, per se, and just basically crumbled into nothing. And so you're left, after about a week, we're left with nothing but a bare circle of dirt. Wow. Oh. Remaining, and that's all that's sitting there now. There's nothing in there. Have you ever had a report like this before? No, I've never heard of one like this before. What was the next report? The next report actually was, this was uh, near the town of Tabor, Alberta. And this one is interesting to myself, to me too because it has some similarities to the Essex County case. And this one was found July the 7th. There's one large oval shape and then some other like curved right. pathways and straight pathways uh, attached to it and inside it. Um, but all the pathways are one foot wide, approximately. And this was in four foot tall barley. And that's all that this consists of, is these one foot wide pathways. There's, and the whole formation is about 65 feet across. But what was unusual uh, about this one, too, is that, again, nothing is flattened inside these pathways. All the plants, when first found, were simply missing. Hmm. like they had been pulled out of the ground. Um, but he also gave the uh, description that the soil itself doesn't look like the plants. It doesn't look disturbed. It doesn't look like the plants had simply been yanked out by someone. It, they're just simply gone. So again, we have these couple cases so far which are, I would say, quite unique for continual updates about Canadian crop formations, go to Paul's website, www.cccrn.ca. That is Crop Circle uh, Connector Research Network, or sorry, Canadian Crop Circle Research Network, .ca means in Canada, and to report Canadian crop formations please contact Paul Anderson at his email address, which is paulanderson, as one word, at cccrn.ca. Now, not only are strange phenomena interacting with plants around the world, a bizarre, unidentified animal has been reported and photographed in Connecticut, Maryland, and Elmendorf, uh, Texas, the past few weeks. Some media headlines about the creature in Texas ask the question, chupacabra, meaning that alleged goat sucker of Puerto Rico and Mexico that was such a sensation in 1995 to 1996. The descriptions back then were of a gray-colored creature whose skin had spots and very little hair. Some eyewitnesses said the creature could walk on its hind legs and then fall on all fours and run rapidly, even jumping six-foot-high fences. The chupacabras was notorious for killing chickens, rabbits, and goats, leaving three-inch-long puncture holes in the carcasses, often without any blood. This week I talked with Terry DeRosa, a spokesman for the San Antonio Zoo, about the photographs of the Elmendorf, Texas creature. He said it was definitely not a coyote, which some people had postulated, but he didn't know what it was based only on the photographs. So far, no forensic or DNA analysis has been done by anyone. This week, I also reached the farm owner who shot the creature on his Elmendorf farm. His name is Devin McAnally. He is now retired after teaching high school English and was a basketball coach for 41 years. First, he lived and worked in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then later moved to the San Antonio area, and finally out to this very remote farmland, about 30 miles southeast of San Antonio, about five miles downstream 
from where the San Antonio and Medina Rivers join together. Back in the second week of May of 2004, Mr. McAnally found about 40 of his chickens killed, and he suspected maybe a wild dog or a neighborhood dog. And then, one morning, an alarm came from his own little long-haired terrier dog. I heard her bark, and her very unusual bark. And if you've had a dog very long, you know, you recognize what their barks are all about. And uh, so I looked out the window, and there was this uh, a, a little odd-looking animal about 20 yards away eating uh, mulberries under a tree. And uh, she totally ignored the dog. It was though the dog weren't screaming at her. <laughs> and uh, I thought at the time that it might be uh, an abandoned greyhound pup. I had found two on down about a couple of miles down the road from me uh, that somebody had abandoned and they had starved to death. Could you describe the color and the size? The color is about a light Weimaraner color. And the size is about, oh, I'd say 20 inches tall, about 30 inches long, and about uh, 20, 25 pounds in weight. Now, when I think of the, the, that particular Weimaraner dog, I think of it as being more gray than tan or beige. Right, definitely. It was a blue-gray. Okay, so blue-gray, and could you see any hair or spots on it? No, uh, the only thing, it had a very smooth skin. There were no, uh, uh, what you would call, mange uh, you know, eruptions or anything like that. Uh the only hair on it was a very neat, evenly patterned, one inch long on either side of its spine, just down its spine. Uh, the feet were barely bigger, the paws were barely bigger than my thumb. I just couldn't believe that it could actually stay balanced on them. So very tiny. Very tiny. What did you see specifically in the mouth region of this creature uh, on your property? About the mouth? just that the muzzle was very sharp, very long, and very pointed. Could you see any fangs hanging out of it? You bet. Uh, you can't see it in the photos. Well, you can see the upper fangs. They have one fang on either side, a canine, that is about three inches long and extends outside the jaw. Three inches long? About three inches long. Then they had... Um, a counter fang coming up from the, lo the lower jaw, outside the jaw, that mat up and matched with and fit into the upper fang. And it was about half that size. So the upper ones were three inches long and the lower ones were about a one and a half inches long. That's correct. And the, the diameter would have been about how much? Goodness, I don't know. A uh, quarter of an inch. Okay. Because that matches very closely to what veterinarian, at least one veterinarian in Puerto Rico, found in rabbits in which holes extended from the, below their jaw up almost to the brain cavity, uh -huh. uh, three inches long mm -hmm. by about a quarter of an inch long. He said it would look like a soda straw. Well, that's, just, that's sort of the way this looked. What was it that uh, brought you to shoot her? Well, I felt like the, the, the first, no, the second and third time I saw it, maybe even the first, that it was going back to the scene of the crime. To the chickens. It was very close to that chicken house. And did you then sit and wait with your gun? Yes, I did. It died very strangely. It died, just it just slumped over when I shot it. Didn't make a noise. Didn't, I said, never saw any sign of blood. Even after when I walked up to it and saw how odd it was at a closer uh, distance, uh, I... Uh, uh, put three more bullets in it. Never bled. Well, that's peculiar. Well, I never saw any blood. Um, where did you shoot it? I shot it under uh, the same mulberry tree. Uh, the fourth time I saw it, I shot it. And where on the body did you shoot it? I have no idea. I was about 20 yards away. But you approached it to take the photos? Yeah. I was about... Five or six hours later, I was over at another rancher's house helping them trim some trees, and I was telling the lady about it, and uh, they're very science-oriented, too. 
And uh, she told me to go back and take her digital camera and go back and take pictures or people wouldn't believe me. And I'm glad she did. So you didn't uh, walk up to examine this animal right after you shot it? No closer than 10 yards. Because? Uh, it had a, It didn't have any hair on its body. I didn't want to uh, get something that was contagious. It didn't move. And I thought, you know, I've shot many a possum that was killing my chickens. And I thought, I'll, you know, if, in case it's playing possum, it's going to get some more bullets. Mm-hmm. And I never saw any blood. Uh, later on, when I took the pictures, I used a long handle shovel and turned it over two or three times to get different angles. Mm-hmm. And you still didn't find any blood on it? No. Because the, the photos are very clean. And I, and I didn't see where the bullets went in either. Was there any reaction on the part of the animal to indicate that the bullets had, in fact, hit it? It just slumped without making a sound. Just right, it just slumped to the ground right where it was, and that's all, that's all I ever, no movement, no sound. This is really peculiar, especially if you couldn't see bullet holes. Yeah, this was a young female, and it was pregnant. The one you killed? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and what you're saying is, is that if this was a pregnant female, then there must be a male somewhere. I'm presuming. Now, how did you know it was female and pregnant? Oh, it was obviously female. There was a paunch to the belly. Okay. And it tucked way up back towards the uterus. Now, what was it about this creature that you thought was obviously female? Oh, it, it had uh, uh, it looked the same way a dog did behind, under its tail. Meaning that it had a vulva? Uh-huh. Okay. Not breasts, so. though. Yeah, I saw teeth. Okay. And but that's why I think it was a young female, because those teeth weren't developed. Is it be preserved someplace so somebody could do DNA analysis? I let the fire ants get take you know take a lot of the problem away, and um, then I buried it. So there's no chance of getting DNA then from it. Are you kidding? They can get DNA from the from the hide or from the, the remaining uh, uh, tissue. Well, I'm curious why you wouldn't have tried uh, to get that into uh, some kind of refrigerator or something. Well, I my freezer is full of wild pig and wild uh, uh, and deer. We were making tamales for a church sale, so I wasn't about to, you know, go to a neighbor and say, "Could I use your freezer for a dog that might be contaminated?" <laughs> now, uh, what is it that you think this could be? Um. The lady who was interviewed in the store said that it looked like a chubacabra that her grandmother had described to her from Mexico. There is a hairless dog in Mexico to this day. And from all indications, it probably came from the wild. The Indians of northern Mexico told a story to the first settlers that there was a wild dog that they called of some long name. So you're saying that maybe what has shown up on your place so remote in Elmendorf, uh, southeast of San Antonio, could be some kind of genetic uh, throwback to the ancient hairless dog that likes to attack chickens. Exactly. Okay. I tried to get my own information. I passed it around among people who I thought would know something about it. And the most uh, disgusting response I got was a 30-second glance, and ah, it's just a, a it's just a, a mangy coyote. <laughs> Who said that? A veterinarian, five biologist in a lab, uh, an old-time uh, uh, fish and game person, uh, wildlife management person from the King Ranch. Well, could you have? Uh, wrap this thing in a towel and put it in your truck and, and driven it to these people? No. Because? Because I didn't want to get contaminated if it had some strange disease. Oh. Now, after you shot this creature, did you try to get in touch with those people in the government? Within 30 minutes, I called and left a message on the phone line with the Texas Game and Wildlife. Mm-hmm. Never, they never called me back. Really? Yeah. And I described it fairly well, I think, on, over the phone message. Oh, and two other people were approached later by friends of mine uh, and, a, and a relative 
uh, another fish and game and wildlife man and a couple of zoo uh, workers. And they all said, you know, uh, uh, a, a dog with uh, the uh, uh, mange or... That everybody that you talk to in an official capacity seemed to lack any curiosity about trying to find out what this was. Even worse, almost like resentful that they were presented something that didn't fit their preconceived ideas. If they couldn't put it in the pigeonhole that they already had, they didn't want to talk about it. How do you analyze that? I think that that's uh, just how scientific people become the victims of their own uh, uh, attitudes. Mm -hmm. They become very institutionalized, and they're not there as curiosity seekers, which probably started them on that line of profession in the first place. Do you think that you could possibly build some kind of a trap in which you might be able to capture alive the possible male? Well, I doubt it for this reason. I have been trying to catch trap wild pigs for quite some time. And uh, I've been using a type of bait that they advertise no animal can resist. Right. And uh, the wild pigs I couldn't catch. They got very, very, they're very intelligent. And I had, I have a fairly good size, have a hard trap. And uh, I tried catching this animal that I shot uh, over a half a dozen times. And no takers. Gosh. It seemed disinterested in dead birds, actually. And have a heart trap, you can't put a live bird in there. Right. So the animal is probably quite intelligent. Exactly. Mr. McAnally sent me large photographs that he took, uh, they're digital, and you can see them in this report. Go to the top of www.earthfiles.com at the top of the headline page and click on the hot link to this report. I found it interesting studying these photographs that on the gray-blue skin, there are dark spots, similar to what people drew for me back in uh, the uh, 1996, early 1996 period when I was in Puerto Rico uh, trying to investigate the Chupacabras mystery. And I've thought a lot about Mr. McAnally's suspicion that this creature could be a hairless dog that Aztecs knew about centuries ago and has been considered extinct. Could a wild, hairless Mexican animal with long fangs have survived for centuries without being seen again until the mid-1990s? I sincerely hope that Mr. McAnally can trap one creature alive for cynical scientists to examine. And in the meantime, if anybody listening or Whitley, if there's anybody that is willing to uh, try to get uh, some kind of bone or tissue sample from this creature that is buried in the dry sand on Mr. McAnally's Elmendorf, Texas farm, he is willing to have people do this investigation. Interestingly enough, there is. Uh, my brother. My brother is an amateur naturalist. He's an attorney. And he has seen this creature. Oh, wow. He saw it about a year ago while, uh, I think, snake watching. They go, he go, he and his friends go looking for, they don't take them, but they like to catalog them, exotic snakes in South Texas. There are lots of them there, and and they do, do birds and all kinds of things. They're always out there looking for unusual animals. And one of these creatures walked past them, the two of them, himself and his his close friend, uh, in the I believe in the middle of the afternoon uh, by a roadside, and they were able to observe it from just a few feet away. And he was immediately conscious of the fact that this was no ordinary animal, that this was not a cataloged animal. He knew it instantly. And uh, he, when he came across this story a few days ago. He called me very excited and said, some guy has shot one of these creatures. He mentioned seeing it uh, some time ago when we were talking about the Maryland case. He mentioned he had seen this. He said, some guy shot this down in Elmendorf. Of course, we know that community in that area like the backs of our hands. Our father was from Yorktown, Texas, and you know that part of Texas is uh, like my backyard. Uh, well, this would be something because I can definitely put you in touch with Mr. McAnally, 
uh, to see if you all can get some kind of serious investigation of what is left. Well, I think we probably can, and Richard's very interested in doing it, so uh, we will do it. And, of course, as time passes, uh, we will report on it on this radio program, too. It's a very interesting coincidence that my brother would happen to be have such a personal involvement in this, but it's exciting. Oh, it is. And if something that was considered extinct could actually be one and the same as an animal that was described by the Aztecs so long ago and even carved in their stone, still be uh, around on this planet... It just says... Well, you know, it's a, a very quickly. interesting animal. Yeah. It, 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 I'll tell you why. A, a number of things. First, it's omnivorous, and uh, not 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 too many canines are. I don't know of any others. Canids. Right, eating mulberries mm-hmm. and chickens. <laughs> right, and of course, in alchemy, I have to say the mulberry has an extraordinary uh, significance, but that's another story entirely. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. However, it is odd, isn't it, that he said that it just fell over and didn't have any bullet holes in it. That, to me, is the most remarkable piece of fact. It, it, if you it, look at the photos, you'll see the large, clear photos. You can't see any blood or any hole. I know, and I think, I am almost think to myself that they're not shy, and yet it must have died of shock from the sounds. He must have missed. And, and, I mean, I want, I really would like it if my brother could go down there and If I can get him to get involved in the disinterment of the body, which might be a little hard. I mean, he's a lawyer first, (laughs) unfortunately, and somehow I don't see him as really being willing to do that. But we'll see. Uh, Maybe he'll... He's got some friends who are a little bit more nitty-gritty than he is, you know, in terms of their wildlife uh, explorations, and maybe they'll... Maybe he can get a group of them together, and they'll do it together. Oh, I hope so. I think yeah. this is important enough to try to go that extra mile to f- see if we could find out even what the DNA yeah. Oh, and we can like. we we can get DNA testing done on it absolutely. Uh I will uh, there's no question about that. I've got access to lots of labs and uh we can get uh and certainly uh, thanks to the unknowncountry.com subscribers will certainly be able to pay for it. So okay. Uh, well, Linda, listen, this has been a cool report, I must say, and thank you so much, and uh, we will be talking again next week. Uh, this is Whitley Strieber. That he has been squashed, that he has been muffled, that he has, you know, followed the same sad fate of George Pimentel, who 35 years ago, literally this week as we were talking, uh, made a similar announcement of ammonia on Mars from his experiment, which flew on the uh, first really in-depth reconnaissance of Mars, Mariner 6 and 7, sent by NASA in 69, and he was forced to recant a few weeks after he had come out before all of us gathered at JPL with this extraordinary announcement. Because you see, William, if there are these gases in the atmosphere of Mars, because they're so fragile and they're so evanescent and they're destroyed so easily by sunlight and oxygen and all that, it would mean pretty much that there has to be current life on Mars. And that's what he said to Linda, and the fact that he's backed off now in a rather dramatic and and, and terse and acerbic way indicates that uh, maybe he's run into the reality of the suppression of the most important information the human race can potentially encounter. And now conduct, connecting the dots on this, Richard, if, if we're going to suggest or we're going to present evidence that there's current life on Mars, doesn't this also then suggest the, the possibility of ancient life on Mars as well? And isn't that also behind the cover-up? Well, this opens the door to everything. Uh, once you admit as much as one microbe somewhere else, current, alive, happy, you know, going to the beach on the Sundays, watching television, whatever, um, you have opened the door to any extraordinary set of scenarios that you can imagine, including confirmation that that little life, that little guy, is surrounded by lots of other little guys, and it is only part of a long chain of guys up to and including intelligent guys. So yes, it's this seems to be part of the consistent political pattern, which is to make us unique, alone, solitary, all by ourselves, all that is, because if you keep it at that stage, you never have to confront the implications ranging from ruins to UFOs to who's knocking at the door right now. 
And so obviously we're at a critical crossroads in our destiny, and it's no wonder with a, an election. DVD. This is the Stargate DVD, and it is an absolutely fascinating lecture. William at his very best, and it is good. It's absolutely free. Anything you buy in our William Henry section comes with the DVD. So go to the Unknown Country Store right now, click on that William Henry section, and celebrate William Henry as host of Dreamland with us. The DVD does not appear in the store. It will come in your order automatically. You do not need to include it. Subscribers, this will be the only mention of this in your version of Dreamland and the only ad in your version of Dreamland. So do take advantage. We do want you to know about this wonderful offer. Hi, this is William Henry. This is Dreamland. My guest today is Richard C. Hoagland, winner of the Angstrom Medal and a person who is a pioneer in both science and spirit and most certainly a big inspiration to a lot of us young guys in the field of hidden history. Richard, welcome to the program. Thank you, William. It's nice to be here. How are you? What's up at the Enterprise mission today? <laughs> what isn't? We have been waiting for word from Europe as to whether or not uh, the Mars Express mission has in fact detected ammonia and some other organics in the atmosphere of Mars, and there has been extraordinary confusion. There was an interview done uh, a few weeks ago by Linda Moulton Howe, that appeared, I believe, on this show when Whitley was in the in the in the chair. And there were extraordinary hints from uh, this Italian scientist at that time that if he if he hadn't found them, he was so convinced that he was going to find them that he was even announcing which meetings he was going to announce. And then the meeting came and went uh, at the time that we we're you know talking last week, and he was, as far as we can ascertain, a no-show. He is apparently given to the BBC or to Nature uh, a terse set of comments that everybody jumped the gun, he didn't mean it, he hadn't detected anything like that, which is, if you read between the lines of the interview he did with Linda, uh, about a 180 degree turn. So it's our conclusion. Well, in a few minutes you're going to hear something truly new. William Henry's first foray into the world of being a talk show host. I have hosted Dreamland every weekend since 2000, and now I am getting another host, not for every show, but William will be with us every so often, once a month maybe, maybe a little less often at times, maybe a little more often because he's quite interested in hosting these programs and with the depth of knowledge he brings to this he I think is going to really be able to fill my shoes very well because one of the problems that all of these radio programs have is hosts who are not really part of this very complex and very deeply deeply difficult field to understand William is much a part of it as you and I are so William, I want to welcome you as host to this program. In a few minutes, William will be talking to Dick Hoagland, Richard Hoagland, for the first time appearing on Dreamland, to inaugurate William Henry's hosting of the show. Welcome, William. Well, thank you very much, Whitley. I'm truly honored to uh, step in and fill in for you every now and then. I think it's going to be very exciting. Well, I do, too, and uh, I think that uh, you're going to bring a, 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 a whole new perspective to things, but a very a very, uh, uh, shall we say, a very learned perspective as well. And I'm tremendously excited about hearing you talk to Dick. Uh, it's th th That is always awesome. And from the directions that the two of you come from, it, coming together, it's just going to be, I'm, I'm just really pumped. That's all I can say. So let's get on with the show. William Henry, the next voice you will hear is William Henry introducing Richard Hoagland. So we'll be right back with William Henry hosting Dreamland. We're celebrating William Henry's first hosting of Dreamland today in a very special way. Any order you place that includes one or more William Henry books will also include an absolutely free William Henry DV and coming up that they would want to keep the, the pot on the or the lid on the kettle so to speak because it is about to boil over it seems like. I wanted uh, to ask you about this too. I know. In well, before we leave that, let me let me let me uh, pick up on that point because there is another potential scenario. 
if you go back and listen carefully to to the uh, conversation that Linda had with Farmacino, which, as I as I said before, I think uh, Whitley aired on on this show, you will hear him say several times that he wants to announce life on Mars in September. Ah, now you can't do that as a world class scientist on a major mission, the first European mission, unless you got the proof. So the way I I read, and, and if you go to Linda's website, you can actually read the words and, and cogitate on them carefully. But the way I read what Formosino said was basically that he had the data, but that he was politically waiting for the appropriate time to announce. Now, if it wasn't the Coast Bar meeting last week in Paris, and it is September, then that puts a whole new dimension on it, because September is just a whisker away from the November election, is it not? Well, of course, and now we're talking an October surprise here that maybe go along with the line of thinking that says we're, we're on, a, on a downward slippery slope here that begins with uh, 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 just a, it's a quick end to the Cold War with then a run-up to a war on rogue nations. It's all just a preamble to a war with the guys out there. Do you think this could be playing into a scenario such as that? Uh, no. Okay. No, I, look, we 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 don't have anything that could match what those guys out there have. It would be, you know, so that that old joke about you don't spit into the wind or or tug on Superman's cape. I mean, that would be insanity. And our people, while they're pretty well driven and obsessed, they're not insane. You know, no more than the rest of the human species. No, what this has to do is political framing for probably the reelection of George Walker Bush. And that, of course, would, would play in, in the following scenario. The president has put a lot of his metal on the line for his Moon Mars, you know, vision, which is kind of ironic given that the last vision we had of something to do in space that would benefit the human species went back to John Kennedy. Be that as it may, um, there's been a lot of criticism of this administration and the neocons, et cetera, because of, of Iraq, because of the warp war on terror because of you know patriot 95000 because of you know ashcroft because of the whole the whole kit and caboodle to change the conversation just before the election and bring up something so stunning as a central confirmation of life on mars which then would play directly into the president's vision and make him look like a visionary when of course you and i and those people listening to this program most know that this would all be carefully calculated politics, and this announcement would, you know, his announcement back in, in, in January was probably based on evidence that they already have that there's life on Mars, so that, you know, it, it's basically manipulation of, of, the, of the masses and changing the conversation. The bottom line one, one should be asking is, why should this administration give a damn about what's on Mars? Why should they be putting any political capital into going there uh, ultimately, with men and women, et cetera, et cetera, and 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 to and to raise the ante. In the last week, we have seen Formosino muzzled, if if we're reading the tea leaves correctly here. But we've also seen this administration, the president, the White House, uh, officially willing to go to the mat to veto the NASA appropriations bill that did not give them all they wanted, which was about a billion and change in the current NASA budget. And because they're half a billion short, the president, through his spokespersons, is willing to veto, for the first time in my memory, a NASA budget as one of the spending bills that goes into the entire federal budget. So, for some reason, this administration is saying at several levels, space is important. And we've never had an administration since John Kennedy saying space is important. Now, you and I know space is incredibly important question that I put before the House is why does this administration 